How are you? Okay, yes. You look well? Yes. I've just been to see one of my own productions last night. A success? Yes, I think it was. The house was packed. It must have been a success because it's been running for 28 years. <laughs> this is Rigoletto. Yeah. <laughs> it's rather odd. Sir Jonathan Miller. Oh, no. Okay, stop. <laughs> <laughs> I can't bear that title. <laughs> I never use it. This is going to be a great challenge, a great five-minute challenge, mm. to fit Jonathan Miller into five minutes. Well, it's, it's an even bigger challenge to fit Jonathan Miller into 76 years. I mean, <laughs> not because I've got so much, but they're just... Simply lasting that long has been so strange. You can count us down, Jonathan. Four, three, two... We go. <laughs> Does mortality scare you? No. Uh, I mean, if, if you, by mortality you mean my forthcoming death, I'm much more scared by the death of people that I know and love. But my own death, I'm only anxious about because it's often preceded by agony and discomfort, and uh, not the fear of the, uh, of the annihilation, but just simply the thought of being in pain, very breathless and confused. That, I think, is frightening, but the idea of it coming to an end would be a blessing, of course. You're famous for your atheism. Well... Not really. I mean, or, uh, again, I'm, I'm known by all people that I know about being an atheist, but I never use the word atheist of myself. Um, it's scarcely worth having a name for. Um, I mean, I don't have a name for not believing in pixies. <laughs> there wasn't a moment when you became an atheist then? No, no I, n I, never, I never had a religious thought. I mean, that doesn't mean that I wasn't mystified or puzzled by there being anything at all and it isn't as if I wasn't puzzled and mystified by there being something as obscure and peculiar as consciousness as opposed to there being you know stones and glaciers and oceans and so forth it's very odd that there is something which as it were takes account of the existence of these things. Consciousness worries me a great deal, but it doesn't worry me because I think there must be something up there which is super conscious, hyper conscious, which some people like to give this glottally stopped monosyllable name of God to. <laughs> so if I said to you now, actually, I'd like to point out there is an afterlife, mm. that wouldn't excite you. Well, it would, it would, no, it would, it would be very puzzling to think well, what the afterlife might consist of. How would it know it was me? I mean, everything about myself that I know is to do with the fact that I'm embodied. My body makes me here rather than there. My body uh, inflicts limitations on my physical capabilities that I can't run a mile in 30 seconds, that I can't pick up a 200-weight object with my bare hands, um, that I can't see behind my head, um, that it takes me a long time to get from here to there, the fact that there is a here rather than a there, everything is to do with the fact that the here-ness and there-ness of things is determined by the fact that I got a body. How would it know it was me, this thing which outlasted the body in which I am? I mean, there's this naive idea that one's body is simply a sort of lodging in which this rather peculiar a sort of lighter fluid called the soul, lives. Can you imagine the world in 2050? I haven't the faintest idea, really. I mean, we are always being surprised by what, happened, what, what happens in two years' time. All sorts of unexpected things happen. No, I haven't the faintest idea what will happen. I mean, it's, I, I'm curious about it, and it makes quite interesting uh, dinner table talk. Are you excited or scared by modern science? I'm neither. I'm interested in it, in the aspects of modern science which I can get my head round. It gets more and more complicated and more and more beyond me uh, because I'm out of it. I'm, do I'm, I'm not doing it. And there are certain aspects of it when it's very mathematical uh, and uh, involves very, very complicated laboratory procedures which I'm now excluded from. Did your medical training help you as a theatre and opera director? Yes, indirectly and unexpectedly. I couldn't have foreseen that it would, but certainly the sort of sensitivity that you develop about observation and behavioural observation is 
transferable to the theatre. You've uh, said that the considerable t- is to be found in the negligible. Well, a lot of the considerable is found in the negligible, as you know, great authors like Flaubert, who c- can take a trivial, totally forgettable slut like Emma Bovary and turn her into something absolutely considerable. Um, and I think that almost all the things that I find interesting are become interesting because you find that you have failed to notice something which turns out to be more important than you had foreseen. Is it right that you don't go to the opera yourself, that you don't go to the theatre? No, I'm, I, I, I regard myself as a sort of Grand Prix racetrack mechanic. I like fixing things, and I like the th- things coming into the pit and fixing up the, the tyres. <laughs> a good place to end. I have to say that some of those answers were the longest we've ever had on five minutes, but I let you get away with it because you are Jonathan Miller. No, it's just that... Um, I, I, I like to take time to think something out. If anything is important enough, and if there are questions which are considerable rather than negligible, <laughs> you have to um, work them out carefully. Every, almost anything interesting takes time. Uh, it's only the idiotic and the trivial that can be done immediately. Great to see you. Nice to see you.